When we think of TV channels, the big ones always pop into our brains. NBC, CBS, ABC, TBH, and many more. However, growing up in the Midwest when I was a kid, before streaming services were even a thing and we had to go to Family Video, my generation's blockbuster, we also had cable in our household for a few years, until my parents realized they'd rather pay to feed us than entertain us. With not many channels left to choose from, we had to rely on local channels in our vicinity, one of them being PBS. But because I'm not defunct land, we would go over to our grandma's house and watch her TV, which we ended up doing at least once a week. One day, while watching TV, I stumbled across a commercial for one of the greatest and most memorable comedy shows I've ever known. This show is on the KBYU TV channel or channel 11, a non-commercial, educational, independent television station, which means legally I'm now obligated to talk about it. Currently, there are 16 seasons to this show, but there shouldn't be. Although Studio C has been around for a decade, it hasn't been the same cast since it started. Seasons one through nine had the original 10 cast members with three featured cast members who were not regulars of the show just quite yet. Whereas seasons 10 through 50, uh, I mean, whereas seasons 10 through 16 have 19 cast members, which none of the original cast members appeared except for Jason Gray. The earlier seasons of Studio C are much better than the newer seasons, and they should have ended the show at season nine. At least this is my thesis, considering I'm going to be going over the show season by season to not only dissect what types of jokes they use, per season in a huge spreadsheet, but to compare and contrast the original cast to the newer cast. To see who is objectively better at comedy and where the downfalls to the show are. So come on and join me as we enter into my thesis. Oh, actually, uh, the thesis, it's, it's in the trash can, I forgot. It tastes like paper. It's not a perfect show by any means, and there will always be some sketches that just fall flat, no matter the season. But I genuinely loved the original cast members, as well as seasons one through nine, so it'll be really interesting to not only challenge my nostalgia, but give the new members a fair chance to see what they bring to the table. Mostly because I legitimately stopped watching the show because the old cast left. Also, no one else has made a retrospective on Studio C yet, so therefore, I win. Studio C is meant to be watched in episode. Episodes. So when you watch just the separate sketches on YouTube, sometimes the main joke gets ruined because you already know what to expect. So hence, I will be viewing it on a per episode basis like how it was aired on TV, which is how I've organized my spreadsheet as well, which took way too long. So that is what I will be referencing most of the time in terms of ranking and analyzing the show. Now you're probably wondering, at the time of recording this, I've only researched three seasons and you can't even read them. So I'm probably gonna have to figure out a different way to print this because this is, this ain't working chief. But just expect this entire page to be filled by the end of this. I forgot how many classic sketches there are in season one. Six of these are definitely the most hilarious for the juxtaposition, props, and spitting water in somebody's face. for things to get actually hilarious in season one, where I couldn't stop laughing. Don't you turn your back on me. In fact, episode four 
Oh, it's gonna fall. Was the only episode in season one to have two incredibly humorous skits. And these two skits are honestly my favorite out of the entire season. With Dana's Dead being the strongest opening sketch in the first season. While these classics were present in the first season, I don't believe that season one is where Studio C is at its best. I'm thinking more like season two or three currently, but it's not a bad season in general. I mean, sure, there were some hilarious gems, but most of season one really ended up being prop humor, which isn't necessarily bad, Oops. <laughs> but the fact that eight out of the 10 episodes this season, can you stay up had to do with some sort of prop to make a joke. Really told me that they relied on it a lot the first season. Too bad I'm a hypocrite, and that trope ended up being in the most funniest sketches of that season. With that said, however, the longer the episodes went on, the more types of jokes they added to their skits to help give some variety to the season. So I definitely appreciate that. It's going to be really interesting the longer the show goes on to see how the show develops and grows as the years pass by, especially because on the future seasons, that's what people really remember about Studio C. Overall, there were definitely 34 sketches that were funny in some regard, whereas out of the 60, 26 of them were not that funny comparatively to the other 34. So it's nice to know that a little more than half of them actually got me to laugh. But that's the thing with comedy shows. It got me to laugh. And since I'm the one doing the research, that means that my opinion is the right one. While season one with 10 episodes had anywhere from five to eight sketches per episode, the number of sketches per episode in season two with 12 episodes was six to nine sketches. This is due to the introduction of minute long skits. Oh man, must have had a red sock in here. <laughs> oh no, I must have had a cat in there. Which while there were a few that I found to be quite funny, most of the time they kind of flopped in terms of comedy due to the writing. It's almost like they wrote an initial idea for a sketch, but then didn't know how to follow it up after the initial premise, so instead they just cut it short. The exception of the minute long sketches, however, are the Just Jeremy segments, which ended up being hilarious for Jeremy just being his weird self. Unlike season one, season two had hilarious sketches in every single episode that actually made me laugh out loud. I almost just <laughs> tripped, which means my previous guesstimate had proven correct. I'm thinking more like season two or three coming. This season definitely had some bangers by introducing new characters like Mr. Ecclestone, Lady Shadow, and Captain Literally and Lobster Bisque Guy, as well as bringing back some classics from season one. Season two also had the trends of awkwardness, loudness, slapstick, and facial expressions for the most part when it came to the most hilarious sketches of the season. And while season one only had six hilarious sketches, season two had 39 hilarious skits. Regarding some highlights this season, there's a new intro and song, and there was an amazing Amazing episode. Hilarious sketches back to back, which was episode four. I also noticed that there were no sketches in season two that were pretty funny. I guess that makes sense since season two is where they start introducing misogynistic jokes. Well, it doesn't look like you. It looks like a... It doesn't look like you. Since we're on topic, let's dissect the joke trends between seasons. While the jokes most used in season one had to do with some sort of prop humor, season two was either awkwardness or slapstick most of the time. Season one had 10 to 25 joke types per episode, while season two had 14 to 28 joke types, which means they definitely tried out some new jokes that weren't previously in season one. Season two also had the introduction to your mom jokes, misogynistic jokes, racist jokes, and well, that one didn't age quite so well jokes. Honestly, saying all of that out loud makes none of them really age quite so well. I will admit, however, it sounds worse than it actually is, since this is a G rated show apparently, and well, you be the judge. The dark side is totally lame. Your mother is totally lame. Ah! Oh, okay. Wow, no, no, no. Don't no, make no. me a dance with oh, oh, oh. That is just misogynistic. Finally, the Indian in the cupboard. We prefer Native American. <laughs> Bill Cosby. What? Who is this? That's not Bill Cosby. He 
tricked me? At the time of these jokes, it was 2013. That's literally just a fact. This show isn't a mean-spirited type of comedy, and I think because of their credibility as well as their claim to fame as a show that has feel-good laughs without being crass and is a sketch comedy show for the entire family, it makes sense why this show really doesn't get any backlash for some of their jokes that just haven't aged so well. I'm not even saying that they necessarily deserve it, since I personally believe comedy should be a place of introspection and perspective, and there is a way to do it without being disrespectful. Studio C is not a disrespectful platform, and there is never any malice with the writings, which is one reason why I love this show so much. It's a positive space for talented comedians that share a love for comedy. And that's just really cool to see. You thought this was the conclusion? Well, joke's on you. We still have 14 more seasons to get through. Also, sorry for that sappy mess. I just feel like I need to give some more context to the show as a whole because I honestly believe in what they're doing as artists of comedy. Overall, season two out of the 95 sketches, 57 of them made me laugh. Similar to season one, season three only has 10 episodes, except season three is where they started introducing specials, but we'll get to those later. This season was the introduction to bloopers at the end of episodes, the worst blank ever series, Kyle, which is probably the worst character in the entirety of the show because the whole point of this character was to add the hyper kid trope. And they even had shorter sketches that most of the time don't work. The following is based on actual events. Hey, what's up, man? Hey. On the positive side, however, they brought back some characters from season two with some different twists. And they finally did some crossover skits, which were definitely clever. Season three had a good mix of jokes with a lot of awkwardness, juxtaposition, and prop humor, and definitely didn't lean too heavy on one type of comedy. Episode four was the Halloween special and had all hilarious sketches, which definitely made it a highlight to season three. Episode 10 was the Christmas episode, which although the sketches were all over the place in terms of comedy, it had one of the most memorable sketches for me personally. Christmas cards, a sketch I've never forgotten about. The joke trends this season go all the way up to 33. Ooh, look, a new record! Currently, season two has the most hilarious sketches out of these three seasons. And like season two, there's no pretty funny sketches in season three. Because there's well, misogyny? Guys, I thought we talked about this. I wasn't even one of the options! What? <laughs> Who was that? What? Oh, oh, gotta go, uh, makeup and leggings, etc. I guess the only upside is the fact that they finally make fun of men. Very equal opportunity of you, Studio C. My client is literally incapable of committing this crime. Yes, or any sport or any other activity you might consider manly. Ah uh, yes, since I am a man, I'm allowed to make fun of man. <clears throat> anyway, out of the 73 sketches this season, 51 of them were funny. Since I watched seasons one through three in my office, which is why most of the shots have been in my office. Wow, I'm an artist. Seasons four through six will be watched on my couch. Returning in season four was the worst blank ever series, which is a pretty hit or miss series to bring back, to be honest. And it didn't really land that well in terms of delivery. So they should have just let the series die. Wake Up USA was another one-off skit turned series purely due to the sequel they did parodying Celine Dion. And while the original Original sketch wasn't that funny to me at least it ranked on literally the same level as the sequel sketch kind of funny and clever but none of them were really memorable or hard-hitting sketches the only positive thing that returned this season was the lobster bisque guy who somehow still found a way to keep the jokes fresh and clever in ways I was not expecting which made it hilarious regarding some of the new things they tried this season both good and bad tweeting rainbow and Marcus were definitely the downfall of the season and there were 10 10 tweeting rainbow sketches, which means that this series technically has the most sketches in it so far. Every single time it came on, I was very furious because not only does this mean that I actually tricked you because this is just another version of these super short sketches that 
don't land, which means that while it's technically a new series, it was just another way for Studio C to fill time in the episodes, almost like a bumper, even though it technically wasn't even a bumper because at least some of the bumpers were actually funny. The opposite end of the spectrum, however, was the Gary and Carl show. This was an interesting case study simply because these were the slowest burning sketches I've ever seen, mostly because it took many episodes for the conclusive third sketch to make sense, which made the joke actually funny. It was hinted at over the first two sketches, but once we got to part three, it actually became funny for its self-aware humor. Now, the opposite of that opposite leads us back to a negative series. Marcus picks up chicks. I've never liked the series, not as a kid and not now, especially because the character Jason is playing is kind of an arrogant jerk with no personal space. Yes, there is a way to do it to make it funny, but this series was honestly one of my least favorite I've seen so far besides Tweeting Rainbow. It showcases an era of YouTube but not a good era and doesn't execute it very well. I think a better example of this same style would be the epic girlfriend prank skit that Tomska did. It's not exactly the same premise, but shows a similar era of YouTube and does it better. Also, these skits remind me of certain YouTube people that I don't like, but I'm not gonna name names. <coughs> Andrew Tate. Speaking of drawing, one of the new characters couldn't do that in the show, unless he used paint. I guess. Season 4 was also the start to Maytember 16th, a pretty popular inside joke in the Studio C sphere, kind of like the name itself. After this point, they kind of just use it whenever they can, if it makes sense, but not too often. In one of the sketches this season, you can clearly see it since this was a trailer for their movie Treasure Hike, which was a perfect to use case for it. The last two observations I've made about this season is that it's really funny, first of all, when any cast member breaks character, and that the final skit was a good send-off for the end of the show. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Meese. When we started Studio C two years ago, we had one goal in mind, to create the best hour-long drama series the world has ever seen. We failed in every conceivable way. Despite that, we had a lot of laughs. But sadly, the show now has come to an end. The bad news is, it's over. By send off, I mean fake out, obviously, because we're only in season four. Also, this season had the intro to fat phobia, which is obviously offensive to me. I'm coming out as a Couchville resident. Speaking of couches, a grand highlight to season five was the Couchville duology a personal favorite of mine, which is the correct opinion since the sketch has millions of views. If I were to recommend any Studio C sketch, it would have to be the first Couchville sketch, which consisted of 10 forms of humor and was a technical masterpiece, especially down the line when it gets so ridiculous that it starts to create its own lore. Turns out I have all day today, I have no client projects, so I'm going to issue myself a challenge today. I'm going to watch as much Studio C as possible today, see how many seasons I can get through. This is a, this, oh boy. Now I can't mention a highlight without a low light. So let's see what other sins Studio C has committed. Puberty. Susan Weber's was and is the worst series to date. I never liked this at any point, and I don't understand the people who do, to be honest. With a combination of speech patterns, loudness, awkwardness, props, stereotypes, and racism, while also pointing out that the entire joke is a teen being bad at makeup, it just never lands and I wish it never existed. At least with Tweeting Rainbow, it was over in like 10 seconds, but this just goes on and on as I roll my eyes every single time this series pops up. While there's only three sketches in this specific series, this has to be the bottom of the barrel, right? Certainly we won't see anything worse. Hey, why does it say foreshadowing on the screen? Am I doing this because I'm insane? Yes, but also I want to answer the question is how many seasons can you watch in one sitting if you have like an entire day? Because each season has anywhere from about 10 to 12 episodes, at least that's what I've found with my research, and each episode is about 20 minutes long. So that means it'll take about three and a half hours per season. So I think I'll be able to get done two of the seasons, maybe. Well, we've gone over the good, the bad, and now it's time to go over the okay? There were a bunch of new faces in episodes 1, 2, and 9. In episode 6, they did another soap opera, but the original was better. Episode 8 was a throwback to season 2, which was the first time they pulled a sketch from three seasons ago, but again, the original sketch was better. Episode 9 has an MLM product. Oh, please, no, not her! So, I think I'm about halfway through the season. I just finished episode 5. I started around 
9.50 and it's like 12.15. I think I'll be able to get through at least one season. Since we've gone over the good, the bad, and the okay, Let's go back to the good because there were actually a lot of really good highlights in this season. In episode one, the costume slash makeup design in the sketch is really good for the Disney Plans Heroes death sketch. Episode two had voicemail problems. And while it was just an excuse for Jason to showcase his voice acting talents, it was a good excuse. Episode four was the Halloween special. And not only did Matt almost break an awkward Puritan double date, but this was the season of the glorious Breaking Bad sketch. You're an artist, Mr. Wade. Now I need you to distribute these to every school in the valley, starting with the technical college. Those kids crave math more than anyone. You write all of your math in blue ink? What if you make like a mistake? I don't make mistakes. My math is pure. I must have forgotten how good season five was because episode seven has the most famous sketch of Studio C. Top soccer shootout ever. Chew all. Calm down. I'm recording. I'm recording the narration. Top soccer shootout ever with Scott Sterling. Episode 10 was the Christmas special, and in this season, it had all hilarious bangers. Could not pick a least favorite or even a favorite for that matter. This season also has the peanut butter and jelly sandwich sketch, a very popular sketch between my friends and I, so it has a very special place in my heart. So finally just finished watching season five. That took about a four hours. <laughs> Overall, they cut down the amount of sketches per episode, which I appreciate because typically, whenever they do super short sketches, it rarely ends well. With a lot of props and awkwardness in season five, most of the sketches were funny this season. With only 14 sketches, that didn't make me make the funny noise, which means that there were 67 sketches this season, leading to 53 funny sketches in season five. Now go away, it's bedtime. <laughs> I am free. I am free. Season six took a lot out of me. Not only because this season is double the length of a typical era, but halfway through research, I ended up getting pretty sick, which gave me a foggy headache and further delayed the project. Even writing this now, I can barely concentrate on what words I so choose, which lasted days. Since season three, there's been 10 episodes per season, which I believe is a perfect length for the show. Season six, however, doubled the length of the season, which I don't think was a good choice for this show specifically. Typically, you could finish the season in three to four hours, since each episode is about 20 to 25 minutes long. Now double that. Yeah, that's a lot. Not to mention that it took twice as long to research the season specifically, so for about a month straight, I feel like I was stuck on season six. Well, good thing I'm done watching season six and there will only be 10 episode seasons from now on. Hey, wait a minute, why does it say foreshadowing on the screen? This has been like the second time now. I haven't even written about season five yet since season six has by far been my least favorite season only because they doubled the length of this season. Regarding length, there were 67 sketches per episode and then there's the last three episodes. So close. This is also where the season 50 joke came into play where they allude to something mischievous. After seeing this, I think we can all agree that we should only do 10 more seasons. Yeah. 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 I wanna see that again. Besides the length of season six, I couldn't put my finger on exactly why this season was my least favorite so far. That is until I started organizing my notes and then I still couldn't figure it out. They made a lot of returns this season. So, in the spirit of that, I'd like to return season six to uh, get a better season, please. Season six had the return of 13 different series, including Halloween and Christmas specials, which goes without saying because there's basically at least one of each per season at this point. And Matt still almost keeps breaking character on stage. Point is, they definitely relied on returning characters way too much, and I vastly prefer the original sketches. It's not even that the returning series were necessarily bad, since some of them ended up being hilarious. I just think that the combination of the overall runtime this season, mixed with writers heavily leaning on previous characters, as well as season five being one of the best seasons of Studio C, season six feels like a downgrade from season five. However, there were some positive attributes to season six, and although it's not a lot, it's definitely worth mentioning. The first ever Valentine's Day episode of the show was in episode 12, which was a brand new Studio C special that I greatly appreciate. Season six was where the first Studio C controversy happened, where another popular sketch show made a similar sketch around the same time. Personally, I think Studio C did it better. Now, to top off season six, I must introduce you to the best, least funniest sketch 
in Studio C history. This sketch doesn't even feel like a sketch. It feels more like a short film, a work of art. If anything, it's one of the scariest Studio C sketches to date due to the sheer mortality of human life. It's one of the most impactful creations that Studio C has ever made and shows testament that even a comedy show can really break down our lives in the simplest of ways to hopefully show that our demise isn't actually the end, but rather a continuation of our traditions and beliefs that impact other younger souls that are still living, even when we are no longer there. All right, since we've gone through about a third of the show at this point, let's compare stats between seasons one through six. The most common length per season usually aims around 10 episodes. Although seasons two and six differentiate from this pattern, my wand just broke. We know that season six has the most amount of sketches, clocking in at 129 sketches total. And in second place is season two with 95 sketches. Since we now have the total number of sketches between seasons one through six, we can do some basic math to figure out how many sketches were both hits and misses. Season one only had six hilarious sketches out of 61, which to be honest, isn't that great. However, if we factor in all of the sketches that were at least funny, we have 34 out of 61 sketches, which was a little over half. Season two had 38 hilarious sketches out of 95 total, and 82 of them were funny, which means that most of season two is worth a watch. Oops. Season three had less total sketches, 73 to be exact, 26 hilarious, and 50 overall were worth a watch. Oh my gosh. Season four had 84 sketches, 32 hilarious, and 55 total funny. Season five went back down in number of sketches. However, more than half of them were hilarious, and most of them were actually funny, which means so far seasons two and seasons five are looking like the best so far. Now season six, well, that's an interesting case study. Totaling 129 sketches, 62 of them were hilarious, and 97 of them were at least funny. But here's the thing, this season has double the amount of episodes that a typical Studio C season has. So let's say hypothetically, we just half the numbers, we get a total of 64.5 total, I don't know what a half sketch would be, but maybe one of those 30 second sketches like Tweeting Rainbow, I don't know. 31 hilarious sketches and 48.5 that were at least funny. This would mean that season six would actually be second to last in number of sketches, third from last in hilarious sketches and second to last in funniest sketches. So literally because there are double these sketches in season six, its rating went up only because there were more opportunities to actually have hits in the show. This is why instead of doing it this way, we're gonna go to the percentages per season. These percentages show what percentage of the show was actually funny in regards to the funny sketches per season. If it got not funny or kind of funny, it's not making this list. It has to be at least funny and upward. All right, enough ranting. We have the percentages right here. This proves my theory currently that seasons two and five are the best seasons so far. With season six just barely making it in third place, despite it having double the episodes. A longer season doesn't automatically mean a better quality in the overall sketches, but it can in fact have the exact opposite effect. Sorry, I must have been watching season seven. Ugh, talk about a snoozer. And why do you ask, was it a snoozer? Well, these are the reasons. I can explain. Necrophilia, arson, surreal horror, furries, breaking a lot of stuff, and a lot of dismemberment, like, way too much. Like to the point where I don't think this should be G-rated anymore. It was at this point in the show that I also noticed that there was a lot of blood, like way too much. There is so much blood that there is a literal sketch about it in this season with literally buckets of blood. It really made me think that they really got away with a lot on this show. So if you're into any of that, this season is for you. What have I done? You know, I'm starting to realize the longer the show goes on, the more insane it seems to get. Yet with each season, the visual effects keep getting better and better to almost a uh, 
how shall we say this, a concerning degree. Now listen, with stating all of these things about the show, context definitely matters. Surely I'm just embellishing these joke types for comedic effect, right? She's not asleep. She's dead. What? <gasps> he wants to kiss a dead corpse. That's not normal. My daddy's dead. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. Uh... Mommy says that he got shot up into the sky. Okay. But I think she killed him in a fire. Yeah. Are, are you serious? Yeah, that's how my Barbie got burned in. <laughs> Teaching fire to kids? Ooh, not sure the fire department would sign off on this one, chief. So what did you guys make? <laughs> a chicken. Fun. What'd you make it out of? Popsicle sticks? Nope. A chicken. <laughs> Okay, so I originally wrote surreal humor, but this is just straight up terrifying. Yeah, so you see one that you like? Yeah, I think I see it. Oh, is it the orange striped one? No, it's this black fluffy one. <laughs> Meow. That's literally just a furry. Discover why women are raving about a revolutionary way to look beautiful. Ugh, Wait a minute, this is just ableism. Guess that's going on the list. Smash everything! Smash. Speaking of breaks, there were at least five sketches this season where one, if not more, of the cast members almost broke on stage, an all-time high for any season thus far, with the main culprit being Whitney. At this point, whenever they bring back a reoccurring character, it's as funny as a frog on the floor. Sure, you could try to make a smash hit, but it's just gonna feel forced. Worst ever, Spencer, Oh Yeah, and I Don't Do Mornings are back, and I wish it stayed out in the wilderness. I know I said I wouldn't mention Halloween or Christmas specials anymore, but the Christmas special this season should have also stayed out in the woods. Why? The surreal horror. Some other cons this season include the most... Morst? <laughs> Okay. Some other cons this season include the most organic vlog, which was definitely the weakest series this season, and the country song because Bo Burnham did it better. To conclude this season, I'm going to tell you about four specific sketches from season seven that are definitely worth a watch and are highlights to season seven, and each of these fall under the pros of this season. 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 Season, season, season. The first hilarious sketch of the season was the vlog father with guest star Shay Carl. Typically, whenever they have a guest on the show, I rarely find the jokes to be funny, but this sketch had me laughing so hard for its genre bending humor. The other funniest sketch of the season was the cookie diet, which is all I'm gonna say about this specific sketch because I really don't wanna spoil it, but it was a really fun time. Number three was the Phantom of the Opera's girl problems due to the fact that the costume and makeup was so good in general, especially later on. On in the sketch. Lastly, watch this ultimate skate park disaster with Sean Duris includes another guest and is impressive from a technical standpoint. With season seven having 19 episodes, seven to eight sketches per episode, 29 hilarious sketches, 70 funny sketches in total, with props and awkwardness being the top trend. This season score was 70 out of 138, so about half of them were hit or miss. This definitely had a similar problem to the last season where there were more episodes, so therefore for, there were more chances to have a good sketch, but half the time it didn't work. Not the best score, but not the worst score? I guess we'll find out later. Now, season eight is a very curious case. This is where they start officially showcasing the sleek, new, longer, high budget intro to account for the new cast members. While it is very impressive, and I believe I've never seen this newer intro before, so it took me by surprise, the only name that is revealed on screen besides all the cast members is a man named Luis Malaman. See, this is interesting in and of itself because every time we've seen the intro, the creators of the show were Jared Shores, who occasionally appears as a cameo and worked on seasons one through seven, and Matt Meese, one of the original cast members of the show, have always been credited. Mates of State don't even get credited in this intro, and they're the ones responsible for the intro song. So, who is? Luis Malaman. Well, according to IMDb, he's known for a lot of foreign films and TV shows, none of which I recognize. But the show I did recognize was Heroes. 
He's also worked on an improv show on the same TV channel, which is definitely more recent in his line of work, and has been working with the same channel since 2007. As far as we know, Luis Maloman stepped in the role of a producer of Studio C once Jared Shores left. This wasn't the only observation I found with season 8, however. This season has really predictable jokes with a lot of repeats, which got old pretty fast. In episode 8, it was their celebratory 100th episode of Studio C, which centered around airplanes for some odd reason. I don't get it, and neither do you. Episode 10 was Christmas time once again, and the only reason I'm mentioning it is because it was actually good, unlike last season. This season's episode 14 is probably the worst episode only because almost every sketch is part of a series, which you all know how I feel about them continuing a series when they should just really stop. You know what they did stop, however? Episode 12. It's missing in the catalog, and it's the Valentine's Day episode. Now, the skits are available in the sketches section on the website, which typically I've been watching it from the episodes tab. But since the Valentine's episode wasn't there, the only experience I got with the episode were in the form of the individual sketches. And honestly, it was a good episode overall. While these sketches are not available in the current episodes list in season eight, I really don't think all of these sketches are in the Valentine's Day episode, since we've previously established that even each episode is around 25 minutes long, and the total runtime of all these sketches is about 34 minutes. While this Valentine's Day episode is genuinely funny, there were only a few key situations I found to mention. There was the return of the interrogation sketch, Jason breaks about snake milk, and there's a lot of vomit in this sketch. Oh my gosh. That's so disgusting. Ah, is it still going on? Are you kidding me? Ah. Speaking of returning to haunt you, there are 11 series that made a return and one reference to an MLM product. I'm pretty sure this is like the third reference to an MLM at this point. The only returns I actually found funny were Bad Karma and Lobster Bisque. Wait a minute. Is that cannibalism? Lobster Bisque cooking Bisque and stuff. It's food. You've got to be kidding me. Surely it can't get any worse, so let's mention a few new additions to the show. In episode one, the opener was an offstage sketch, which hasn't been done before in the show, and made me realize that none of the sketches this season were on stage skits, except for one the 80s TV show parody. And while I'm not sure why they almost completely axed the live section of the show, as well as the live audience, it made the show different. I guess, but not in a way that I personally prefer. There are now bloopers before and on the credits, which is an addition I actually really do like. And it is a clever way to make people stay throughout the credits. Last of all, in the Dog Whisperer with Farley Archer. I think she's gonna be just fine. As a dog owner, I find this offensive. With season eight having 15 episodes and 67 sketches per episode, we have seven hilarious sketches out of 93 total and 36 funny out of 92 total. Bit of a nosedive, not gonna lie. Season nine starts off with quite the twist, an hour long live performance in New York City with SNL guest star, Kenan Thompson. It answers the question, hey, what if Studio C was SNL? This contained a new intro with New York B-roll that was actually funny. This is the epitome of my thoughts on a daily basis. On the Please. other hand, you probably should go work out. <laughs> Wait, who are you? Self-doubt. Oh, I mean, I try to be. I, well, I will be here pretty much whenever you have downtime. They had a band perform two different songs, which were not comedic, and this sketch was really funny when Steven got his line wrong. You have not said anything this entire time. I am ill. Ill with worry? Because you are a traitor? I'll go get my aluminium bat. What about her? She seems the least British German of all of us.
Greta is definitely German. An interesting trend that I found in season nine were that the name of the sketches were actually pretty clever, which really stood out to me. Typically, this isn't something I'd mention, but there was just something about it in particular that really made it stand out for me. The rest of the new elements had to do with some of these specific skits that stood out to me. There's a reference to The Office. Kramer looks like Beekman from Beekman's World, and George looks like Larry from Curb Your Enthusiasm. The intermission sketch is by far my least favorite new skit this season, mostly because you're waiting for the setup to be over, only to realize that this is the joke and was played up way too much. There's an escape room skit, but personally, Harley Quinn did it better. The Halloween and Christmas episodes both have new intros. This skit is literally the dirty plate scene from SpongeBob, but with a scissors package. And there was a lot of stabbing this season. <laughs> These were the returning series that made it to the season, all of which I will put on screen, but not actually read, because then my audience retention will go down, as if to say all of you are just a bunch of list haters or something, I don't know. The only series that I'll mention by name are Lobster Best Guy, a return that was well welcomed because they know how to keep the character engaging and humorous no matter what situation he's in. The return of Prince Charming, which feels like a sketch we've already seen since they reused a sketch from a previous season, and even even the prince doesn't know how many times he's done this, which was some great meta commentary. Okay, third time's the charm. Fourth, eighth, thirty something times the charm. Another tongue twister skit, which, wait a minute, why does Adam always get spit on in every tongue twister? was gonna spit. <laughs> Last of all, in the Valentine's Day episode. <gasps> Please no. Why is she back? <laughs> 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 Well, since now my spirit is broken, let's mention the actors breaking this season, which has been happening a lot more in the past few seasons. In an astonishing event, four of the members almost break on stage, and two of them definitely lost it. Pour one out for my homie. <laughs> <laughs> Just... So we kill Ricky, then what? Huh, then what? <laughs> yup, just need to do the whole thing. <laughs> This has become such an occurrence that they use this feature of their acting to their advantage with the drill sergeant skit. Sir, the last time we were in NAMM didn't go so well, I sir. I do not care! <laughs> Reprehensible Ashtabul! I swear! I will have you all join the Vietnam Post Guard! Just go to NAMM! Go! Yowzy Yowza Bo Bowza! Looks like the stats are in. 26 hilarious out of 110 skits and 73 funny sketches out of 110. Looks like we're going back up in the rankings. However, there were more sketches this season than last. So, looks like we really dipped, huh? This is what I love about charts, is that they make my brain happy because now I can fully visualize and understand the numbers that I've been writing for the past four months. What I find fascinating is the difference between season six and seven. Season six had 129 sketches and season seven had 138 sketches. Even though season seven has more sketches, it plummets down both in number of hilarious skits and even just funny skits in general. That trend rides out in season eight as well. But then season nine shoots right back up to third place, both in number of sketches and funny sketches. However, tied for sixth with season three in terms of how many hilarious skits there were. So far, it seems like season two is in first place, season five is in second place, and season six is in third place. I did this by asking Google, what is blank percent out of blank to get my percentages? The first number being the funny sketches and the second number being the total amount of sketches that season. So 
Basically, this proves quality over quantity, meaning my year of insanity is now justified. There are almost a hundred exclusive sketches that never aired with the original episodes. I remember watching some of these on YouTube years ago with some of my friends, and I'd say honestly, most of them are worth a watch. Seasons one to three are just compilation videos, so if you've already seen all the sketches from those seasons, then there's no point in watching those unless you want to see the banter in between sketches sketches from the cast. The customer survey sketches from season 9 are worth a watch, and season 8 only had one funny sketch, Batman v Dora, but it did have a very different series that was only found in season 8. Studio C React. Normally, I would dislike a concept like this since it is pretty well known that it is a pretty lazy form of content on the internet. However, Studio C took this format and added actual value to the genre by injecting insider commentary to the sketches that they actually worked on, which had different cast members each time. And while some of the cast members gave credit where credit is due, Matt was the main person to really highlight the very talented people that helped on the show. Onset was written by a student of mine in, oh, okay. in the sketch writing class. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That I was teaching. Johnny. Johnny. He writes for our show. He does now, yes. He he was a great student, mm -hmm. and so we're like, let's pay you to do things. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want a more behind-the-scenes look at some of these specific sketches, then you're in luck. As for me, I'm just sad because there's no commentary on Couchville. While most of the sketches from Season 7 were funny, as well as Season 5, it's hard to recommend the exclusive sketches from Season 6 because there are 35 exclusive sketches for this season, which is the most amount of exclusivity we've seen yet. However, what have we learned so far? That's right, quality over quantity. 24 were funny out of 35 total. Not the best by far, but one season I'd recommend way more than this one was season 4. This season was definitely the best highlight of all of the exclusive content. Not only are all the sketches worth a watch, but it hosted a pepper challenge to celebrate 100,000 likes on their Facebook page, which showed a more candid side to the cast, but then it did an even better job than that with their documentary. How to Make Studio C, a step-by-step -step guide to making your own sketch comedy show. This had an intro to all of the cast members, each of them explaining how each other work, and focused on the season four opener by showing how they created the insane opener sketch. It shows how much work it takes to make one sketch, how many people it takes, that Jared is the one that oversees literally every step of the creative process, and how they got here. The idea of doing a sketch comedy show started a long time ago. We all were in a sketch comedy group called Divine Comedy. They were passionate about comedy even before Studio C. And this documentary shows that side of them in a very humble way. This show really brightened my day, or I'm going through something really hard right now, and Studio C is a really bright spot in my day for right. like half an hour. And it's like, yeah, that has value for people. Yeah. And, and that just adds to our satisfaction and makes us continue to want to do it. Right. The original air date for the season 9 premiere was September 10th, 2018, and was the original cast's last season together on Studio C. They must have known that this was the case because literally two days later, the very first video on their brand new channel made that announcement. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Mallory. You may know us from Studio C. You may also know us from high school, but probably not. As you may have heard, the cast of Studio C has left the show and risked it all to start a new adventure, which we'll tell you about in 17 seconds. Ooh, for the last six years, we have been making sketch comedy with two goals in mind. Make it safe for families, make it funny. Except, it seems too soon, right? Two days after the original premiere of season nine? Apparently, it wasn't soon enough because it was actually confirmed in August of 2018 that the original cast was leaving to pursue a different endeavor. JK Studios. Near the end of 2018 was a new beginning for the gang we've grown to love. This is where they truly became independent by creating their own thing, producing many different series, most of which would have not been possible if they stayed at Studio C. They became a variety comedy channel, which at the time when they first announced this, this is where I personally fell off. At the time, the concept didn't really appeal to me since I was conditioned to like their sketches for years on end. Now, I'm going to give their newer content a fair chance, since it's almost impossible to talk about Studio C without at the very least 
mentioning JK Studios. So, <laughs> that took longer than expected. Also, I tried to film this segment once before. My air conditioner was running outside. I think that's what that is. I don't know, but it was a loud fan. And literally, as soon as I stopped recording, then it stopped. So, thanks for that. Anyways, there were eight notable series, a movie, and a surprise. Can you tell that the sun's in my eyes? I literally meant it as a joke, but looks like it's not a joke anymore. Manifestation is real. It was interesting to see how Studio C implemented sponsors into their sketches. Very inspirational and made me think on how I would do sponsors in the future. Because if I do them when I finally reach 5K, so please subscribe, it would be on products that I personally actually use in my life, that I could actually talk about from personal experience. And not just Rage Shadow Legends. Not all of their skits were in the playlist, but I tried my best to watch all of them. So this is season nine and a half, or what should have been season 10 of Studio C, if they stay. There were four notable style of sketches that I found to touch on. They're normal sketches, which is what we've seen on Studio C for years already. Finish the sketch, a challenge type skit where Matt would provide the initial footage while the rest of the cast members had to individually respond to it in a comedic way. Animations, which while there were only two of them, the first one was pretty bad when it came to the actual animation even though it had some solid concepts and characters and that second one was not only well animated but the premise was really funny then last of all were the dry bar sketches which not only brought back the live performance aspect of the team but that these are some of my favorite jk studio skits of all time besides that ragnar sketch only because that starbucks cup made me die of laughter also i learned that during one of these sketches Adam Berg wrote a book. Wait, sorry, that's a typo. I learned that Adam Berg wrote three books. All in all, imagine if these JK sketches were season 10 of Studio C. That right there, would have been glorious. However, since one of the reasons they jumped ship from Studio C in the first place was to try out some new and different comedy shows, not all of them were created equal. Ironic, considering they were all created by the same people. They had multiple unscripted series, such as Player Pain, which was a game show where they would play a board game provided by their sponsor of that series, and whoever won donated to a charity of their choosing, but whoever lost had to pay a consequence in the form of pain. Challenge videos were just as well unscripted, which while there was a crossover between the sketches and the challenges, there were normal challenges as well, like how Mallory on the harmonic made of everything made me laugh. Stuck Inside, which was a sit down vlog type show where the bachelors of the group try to do different things. Last of all was Do Your Worst, a podcast where each person reads an old writing of theirs to show how much they've progressed as comedians, as well as clown on themselves, like how Adam is just way too far away from his mic. All right, so let's have a little bit of mic 101. All right, so this is obviously too far away. And this is obviously way too close. This is still too far. And this is still too far away. And this is still too close. Adam was like right here. When he should have been right here. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Another series that I need to mention, although I wasn't super impressed with it, was their mockumentary series, Artists of the World. Now, you know me, I love to highlight the artists of the world, but since this was a comedic take on that premise, especially compared to their other series, I can understand why there was only two episodes. The first episode was about fishing, while the second was about rollerblading, and since most of the jokes relied on accents and stereotypes, I could have lived without it. Unlike Freelancers, which is their biggest series both in terms of scale, budget, and views. Since JK Studios has two seasons of the show, it is now appropriate to mention that I myself have been a freelancer for about five years now. Man, time flies. This means that I am literally the perfect candidate for critiquing this show to see if the series is at all accurate to the common freelancing experience. Like how having multiple clients who have different projects is such a mood, and while the show is played up for dramatic and comedic effect, there was a few moments where it felt all too real. I am in love 
love with the 16 episode series. Season one was really funny and a very entertaining show. It highlighted the possible struggles of being a freelancer while also being a ridiculous take on the matter. And it had some of the scariest scenes I've ever seen. Well, let's just make it through this scary hall of mirrors. <laughs> Oh no, you didn't! Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> so subscribe to my weightlifting channel today, idiot! Oh great, Andrew Tate is back from jail. While season 1 got the help of a sponsor, but mostly had a low budget, season 2 ended up being crowdfunded, starting with an announcement video. For over a year you've been asking us when we're gonna make season 2 of Freelancers. And today we're excited to announce that we're making it now, with your help. They ended up raising over a million dollars for the show. And now it's time to take a look at what an independent show would look like with an actual budget. Season 2 being double the length of the watch time per episode, but the same length in episode quantity, starts with an obvious jump in production quality, not only being partnered with Angel Studios, but literally opening season 2 with an ad for their fictional video production company, Video Production Company, similar to season 1, except immensely better. Hi, I'm Zona Goodwin, producer at Video Production Company. But then... They kept interrupting the show with little ads about Angel.com and how to support the show. You can own an NFT from this very episode. Click the link in description and enjoy the show. Our NFT cell is now open. Hey, right. And we are starting an NFT cell today. Wow. Hey. Oh, but why? Why are NFTs bad? Why are they so bad? Well, why don't we talk about that right now? While I have personally watched a two hour long video essay on why NFTs are bad, let me give you some general reasons as to why they're bad. I tried to erase stuff off this board and instead it's smudged, so that's great. One, they waste electricity. Two, there are countless scams in the NFT and crypto space. Three, there are tons of privacy issues with cryptocurrency. Four, quote, NFTs exist to get you to buy crypto, as stated by Folding Ideas. See Illuminati? That's how you correctly quote somebody and not plagiarize someone. Since this NFT conversation happened because of an interruption in the show itself, all these interruptions, thankfully, didn't hook me whatsoever. I'm not a slave to capitalism. What did hook me was the comedy of the series, pulling jokes from everywhere they possibly can. Which leads me to mentioning probably my favorite joke from the entire series. Hey kid, want some quins? Oh no, I gave that up a long time ago. I know you want it. I can't see in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, I can be. Don't tempt me, tiny devil. Mm, this razzle does dazzle. Be strong, Ryan. You remember the steps. And the euphoria. This show perfectly encapsulates the ups and downs of running a small-time business. How it can feel so overwhelming yet adventurous, and sometimes a little crazy. Cause you know, running across a chip cult is just an average Tuesday, spending time with your friends at a renaissance fair on a Wednesday, and having a mental breakdown on a Thursday. I hate that each gig is a new nightmare! Mm -hmm. I hate that we live paycheck to paycheck! I hate that we can't catch a break and that our clients don't respect us for what we do! Thank you. And then we are wasting our lives on stupid videos that benefit nothing and no one! I really enjoyed both of the seasons of the show. Everyone involved did a fantastic job in their roles. Definitely worth a watch if you want an office-styled show about freelancing. As a freelancer myself, I found the show extremely funny and entertaining. Well done, guys! I also loved that the person who was generally seen as the most idiotic of the bunch when it came to the character he played was the one to always speak out about the real struggles of the job. This is so bad. Don't worry, Zona, things always go wrong for us. Then somehow, people keep paying us. Not enough. I don't have enough money for my heart medication, but I do have hope. Except when I'm afraid, which is always, so I never have hope. Why would I? Things are bad. It is a hopeless netherscape out there. And we, but wary travelers. And here's the thing, it's okay, because we all die one day. Was that a pep talk? You have a heart condition? 
I wouldn't know. I haven't been to a doctor in years. For a comedic take on the office style sitcom drama, it was a roller coaster of emotions. Especially since I wasn't the only one who almost cried at the end of Matt's creepy doll arc. If you know, you know. Jokes were flying in from every which way, and the juxtaposition in the show was unbelievably fun. Or too quickly. There may be dust in that <laughs> safety is so important. While it is a funny show, as a freelancer myself, it really made me think about how my own life and career has impacted the people around me, both client-wise and personally. While sometimes it could feel isolating or mundane, or that some days I'm just completely drained and I don't want to work, <laughs> I wouldn't change it for the most part. I'm very thankful for the position that I'm in, but as a human, I'm always looking for brand new opportunities, always looking forward to the next step of my career, and hopefully, maybe one day, I can make this, my own creativity, my career. Yes, in one way, I technically already did that, but there's always that one part of me that craves something more, especially for new opportunities, to make content that is not only positive, but that highlights the good things that people are doing in the world. Hopefully, more than once a year. This part isn't scripted, but just thank you to all the patrons, quite honestly. I know this has taken like six months to make, but that's because I wanted to make something that I really, really, truly cared about quite a lot and this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time and I've wanted to make a video about so it's kind of nice to stop all the other projects and just focus on this and I want to do that more often so again thank you to all the patrons that make this possible if you're wondering where I've been for the past six months I've been on patreon I've been uploading exclusive content only for the patrons so if you want to see me sooner than six more months because that's probably going to take that long for part two enjoy the patreon if not just thank you for watching because uh it's now time for some cringe. <laughs> Regarding loving life, you know, something that I personally struggle with, I didn't have very high hopes for this. I felt like it was going to be a longer version of the healthy vlogs they did back on Studio C. Literally, whenever Jason appears, that's the funniest part of the video. And I'm not going to lie, I lost interest at episode 7 of season one. It felt like the show was written around their sponsor in both seasons, instead of just making an entertaining show. And I'm saying this because they already tried this in Studio C, and it didn't work, since it is definitely not one of their most popular series. At least with freelancers, they actually tried something different. This just feels like territory they've already joked about. The crunchy white women of society. Honestly, I just found it more annoying than entertaining. With season two, that country rap song caught me off guard, which was pretty funny when the rap first came in out of nowhere. Oh, it's a chat on the mic. Horses, tractors, corn, and such. These are the things I love so much. They literally have an episode dedicated to roasts about them and their personalities, which that was funny. Overall, though, this isn't a series I'd recommend unless you're into reality vlog type shows about rich snobs. A more exciting project the crew has worked on, however, is a movie that was in theaters starting July 2023. Go West. What is this? We are on the Oregon Trail. It's not exactly known for its high survival rate. Oh, there, traveling boy. Well, howdy do, gladiator. Man, I'm just so excited for their first ever movie. Wait, they've made two other movies? How did I not know about this? Stop and Go is a 2021 awkward dramedy film on Hulu starring Mallory and Whitney about a road trip during COVID to save her grandma from a COVID infected nursing home. I don't know why that's so hard to say, which drives the plot forward. With five different studios backing this movie, including Buzzfeed somehow, the beginning of the movie shows the juxtaposition, what life was like before and during COVID and what it would be like if Mallory and Whitney were roommates. Something I was not expecting was that it was really interesting to see these specific cast members swear. And the only reason why I'm mentioning this is because Studio C and JK Studios are known for their clean comedy. So to see this juxtaposition is just kind of funny in and of itself. It doesn't really 
bother me, per se. And it's probably because of the other writers that were credited with helping with this movie. Wait, never mind. They're listed as the writers of this movie. Basically, it's a more adult take on a comedy when it relates to their previous work. It's either not rated or rated PG in Canada which is basically the same thing. Now, since this is a quarantine movie, there's a clear juxtaposition between the sister on the phone and where Mallory and Whitney are staying, where the scenes are color graded differently to signify the people quarantining versus the people who think it's a conspiracy. And a perfect encapsulation of the weirdest conversations that happen when you're stuck with certain people for so long. Overall, it was a really funny movie. And although it got way more adult than I was expecting, I actually didn't mind that at all. All right, we're gonna do a little vlog section for this one because while looking up Stop and Go, this movie, I realized that there were a lot of negative reviews, but not because of the actual like writing of the film. It's because these people were expecting a Studio C centered kind of comedy, but what they got was more of an adult film. And <laughs> all of the reviews definitely reflect this or at least most of them do and I think people were expecting like a Studio C movie when they're already making like a Studio C movie in fact technically there's already a documentary but there's Go West which is like the JK Studios like centered movie Stop and Go is like totally different from that realm and to see people like actually be upset about that I think that was really interesting because they were expecting a family film. Stop and Go is not a family film and these people were expecting that but they were very disappointed because of that because it's not clean comedy. Personally I don't really care because I'm a fan of just general comedy and I kind of like that Stop and Go was like a different take on like the Studio C comedy sphere and I think that was really interesting to watch but not everybody agrees with me on that. And that's totally fine. That was just an observation that I made that I thought was worth pointing out. Who Goes There is the other movie associated with one of the cast members, a horror short on YouTube starring Mallory. Although the initial release date was 2022, it appeared on the writer and director's channel on April 10th, 2023. There's lots of blood, so you know it's gonna be a really dark movie. No, literally, you can barely see a thing. It's really interesting to see some of these cast members in different roles and genres. I would have never expected Mallory, of all people, to be in a horror movie, but here we are. But it was interesting. There wasn't a lot of dialogue, mostly ambient sound effects and music, and I'm not a fan of horror movies personally. Also, when the daughter walks in, why wouldn't she just oh, I don't know, turn on the light? Overall, it's not for me. I thought it was okay, but honestly, not the best thing I've seen out of all the content we've already looked at. And now for the surprise I originally intended before I tripped down the rabbit hole. We got a big announcement. We're gonna be on NBC. Tuesday nights in July. A show called Bring the Funny. I couldn't find the full episode, but found three videos where JK Studios was on the show. I mean, it is on Peacock, but who uses Peacock? There was a minute long interview that was pretty funny, mostly because it was a sketch in and of itself. Following that was an open mic performance, which was a different version of their Happy Fun Friends sketch, using costumes and juxtaposition to create a humorous atmosphere and made this version also funny. Then there was the Comedy Clash performance, a different version of their Viking sketch that turned out very humorous. Last of all, when it comes to other projects not found on JK Studios or Studio C, Matt and and Stacey did an interview with Conan where they talked about the caveat of clean comedy, their most viral sketch, how it was digitally altered in the wide shots but real on the close-ups, while the rest of the cast was sitting in the audience. There was also an interview with Build Series where Keenan Thompson and Tori Pence talked about Studio C and SNL, as well as their origins, inspirations, processes, and limitations with running a comedy show on TV all while alluding to Studio C never stopping. It is weird, I think, again, we're going on ninth season and we want it to keep going. Yeah. And that's yeah. the, the goal is to bring in new people to keep it going, kind of like SNL, just yeah. like, let's switch people through so we have fresh blood, fresh ideas. It keeps going on and on and on forever. Now, normally, this would have been where the video ends. This would have been the reality where Studio C finishes and JK Studios lives on. But 
that's not our reality. There are still seven seasons of Studio C to go, a new era of comedy to see if it holds up to the previous seasons. Although most of you wanted this to be one big video, which thank you for voting by the way, personally, I want to do something a little bit different. There is no conclusion because we've only just started this rabbit hole. I have a deep love for the original cast, so I wanted to pay homage to them in a separate part before we go into the gritty, less savory parts about the group. How it fell from grace, what this show is associated with, and the backlash that the newer cast had to deal with when the older cast left. So join me in part two where I go insane trying to find out the answer to what the C stands for and what it actually stands for. Time to edit. <laughs> 